Hi everyone, it's good evening. Uh, I think we're just going to get started as people continue to trickle to our room, but uh, please feel free to help yourself to snacks and drinks uh, in the back. Uh, so thank you all for being here this evening. My name is Carmen chung um, and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Justice and Accountability. We're a U.S.-based organization that's dedicated to working with communities impacted by atrocity to seek truth, justice, and redress using uh, litigation and collaborative case building strategies, and with a particular emphasis on uh, seeking inclusive justice for those who may be marginalized even within victim and survivor communities. And so it's really a huge delight and privilege for us to be co-hosting this conversation this evening um, with the Emergent Justice Collective, Global Justice Center, and Justice Rapid Response. And of course, enormous thanks to uh, the governments of Australia, Argentina, and Colombia uh, who are sponsoring this event. Yeah. One quick thing I wanted to note, um, this event is being recorded and uh, uh, it will be posted online after this evening. So um, just something that I wanted everyone to be aware of um, as they make their interventions. Just wanted to do a quick preview of what the next 90 or so minutes is going to look like. Um, we're going to start off with some opening remarks from Ambassador Julie Hatcher, um, who's Australia's head of mission to the Netherlands. Um, then um, Amanda um, um, who's the co-founder of the Emotion Justice Collective, is going to make some opening remarks. And then we're going to hear from Samuel uh, Emmerman, um, who's the executive director of Justice Rapid Response. We're then going to hear presentations from our panelists, um, who are Patricia Sellers, um, who's a special advisor on slavery crimes at the Office of the Prosecutor here at the ICC. Um, and then Alexander, Alexandra Lily Cather, who is um, also a co-founder of the Emergent Justice Collective. Uh, Priya uh, uh, Naran, sorry, <laughs> Priya Narayan, uh, um, who's counsel at the Office of the Prosecutor at the ICC. And then Angela uh, Mudukudi. Um, who's the senior legal advisor at the Global Justice Center. Um, after that, we'll, we'll open the floor to questions from the audience. And then finally, we're going to have some concluding observations from the ambassador. Um, so without further ado, because we have a lot of really wonderful and exciting speakers today, um, I'm going to hand things over to the ambassador. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction and uh, welcome to everyone here to this really important presentation. I think I'm the least exciting of the presenters that you have to come, but I can actually uh, start by saying thank you to the organisers of the event, the Emotion Justice Collective, Justice Rapid Response Centre for Justice and Accountability and Global Justice Centre, and to Argentina and Colombia alongside Australia. Look, trafficking in persons and other slavery crimes impact the most vulnerable in our societies, women and children, ethnic minorities, stateless populations, people with disabilities and LGBTQI populations particularly at risk. Often diversity factors such as ethnicity, migration status and gender combine to create particular vulnerabilities to trafficking and exploitation. As a result of these intersections, a cross-sectoral and nuanced approach is required to prevent and respond to trafficking in persons and other slavery crimes. Now, I was asked to kick us off today with some examples from the Australian approach the approach that we've taken within Australia to deal with trafficking and try and make sure that we have a gender-sensitive and victim-centred approach to dealing with these crimes, but also because of the way that uh, we are trying to work with countries of our region, the ASEAN countries that are our new neighbours, uh, to build capabilities and to certainly support uh, implementation of very much a sensitive victim-centred approach throughout our region. So I'm essentially kicking us off with some examples of that that will hopefully tie in some of the other presentations. So to start with in Australia, uh, the Australian Federal Police, uh, which is our national police, we like many other countries, a federal system. We have with state-based criminal laws and state-based police forces, but the Australian Federal Police has national jurisdiction and it has the lead on suspected cases of human trafficking and slavery. And it has for some time adopted a victim-centric approach, which focuses on the protection and support of victims with consideration to intersecting vulnerabilities such as age, 
nationality, ethnicity, gender inequalities, and socioeconomic status. The AFP, as human trafficking trained specialist investigators located across all our capital cities, with dedicated human trafficking teams located in our three largest cities. All Australian Federal Police officers are foundation trained through their purpose-built human trafficking and slavery look a little deeper frontline responder program. The Australian Federal Police work with international law enforcement and NGO partners to promote awareness of human trafficking and slavery, support international investigations, develop capacity and provide training overseas. The Federal Police regularly engage with their foreign partners to support the safe return to Australia of victims of human trafficking or to further a criminal investigation. We now have a countrywide national policing protocol to combat modern slavery and the government's developing now a model for enhanced protection and remedies for individuals who are in or at risk of forced marriage. So that's what we're doing inside Australia. But uh, for over 18 years, Australia's been working with the Southeast Asian countries, the ASEAN countries, as well as ASEAN the organisation to combat trafficking in persons right across the region. Australia and ASEAN developed a 10-year, uh, $80 million counter trafficking program called ASEAN ACT uh, that aims to improve justice responses to trafficking in persons in the ASEAN region while protecting the human rights of victims of trafficking. So what we managed to do together was to sign in November 2015 uh, the ASEAN Convention Against Trafficking in Persons, especially women and children, called ACTIP. It's a lot easier to say than that long set of words, uh, which entered into force in March 2017. It commits all ASEAN member states to pursue human rights-based approaches to countering trafficking in the region. So ASEAN ACT, the, the ASEAN Australia Counter Trafficking Program, works at regional and national levels, focused on building the capacity of criminal justice agencies to implement gender-sensitive, victim-centred and inclusive approaches to countering trafficking, in line with the ASEAN Counter Trafficking um, Protocol. The program also partners with civil society and the private sector to document and start to address the root causes of trafficking, with a focus on labour trafficking as a form of slavery, which is prevalent across Southeast Asia. The program is supporting gender mainstreaming through a multi-year partnership with the ASEAN Commission on the Promotion and Protection of the Rights of Women and Children. Under this partnership, a regional do no harm guide for frontline responders has been developed to safeguard the rights of trafficked victims and ensure that counter trafficking actors are aware of and committed to doing no harm in the course of their work. The ASEAN Commission on the Promotion and Protection of the Rights of Women and Children, with support from the Australia ASEAN Program, is also developing two sets of training materials for frontline responders on gender-sensitive and victor-centred approaches to handling trafficking in persons' cases. The ASEAN Australia program is working with ASEAN member states to integrate victim sensitivity throughout the justice sectors in those countries, with a particular focus on supporting victim-centred and child-friendly courts. The program has developed a set of eight victim-sensitive court indicators to assist courts to undertake a self-analysis of their systems and processes and to work with justice institutions over time to ensure courts and other justice agencies are equipped with the necessary tools and information to protect witnesses and victims. Four studies have been undertaken by the program now with a specific focus on gender equality, disability and social inclusion to contribute to the evidence base for counter trafficking. So, for example, a legal cases review of trafficking in persons in the fisheries sector has been undertaken, and a review of child justice systems in selected ASEAN member states in relation to trafficking in persons. Just a couple of examples. Currently, the program is undertaking a study of the link between disability and trafficking in persons, focusing on Indonesia, the Philippines, and Thailand as the first countries. And the study seeks to document the extent to which people with disabilities are more vulnerable to trafficking, as well as the experience of trafficked victims with disability in accessing justice. Now, these are, these are just some examples of the ways in which we are trying to use our own experience and the, the approaches we've developed within Australia 
to develop similar kinds of capability and approaches right across our region. Uh, there, this is a work in progress, and I think just on the basis of the discussions we had before we kicked off this morning, we can already identify ways in which others working in this field, so we can share information both on what we're doing and what we're learning, things that work, things that don't work. And there's a lot that we can do together by making sure we learn from one another. So really that was just, uh, just a few practical examples to kick us off, uh, and I'm happy to, to hand that to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, uh, Amanda, would you like to go next? Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who is here today. Is this better? Yes. Um, and thank you to our state sponsors. Thank you, really. I'm delighted to be here on behalf of the Emergent Justice Collective. Um, we have such a stellar lineup of speakers today, so I'm going to keep my opening remarks fairly short. Um, but I really just wanted to introduce who we are as the Emergent Justice Collective and what we're hoping to do and accomplish and why we are here today um, sponsoring this event. We are a collective of lawyers, um, researchers, and advocates seeking to nurture an emergent counterculture to the dominant practices in the international justice space. And we focus on pursuing strategies including legal interventions uh, that are centered on intersectionality, community, healing, and transformation in justice and accountability processes. We came together because we were searching for a more equitable, and more sustainable way of engaging in the work that we do. And we quickly recognized that process is just as important as outcome. So we committed ourselves to embodying care and solidarity, interdependence and collectivity in all of the work that we do. And last year, we launched a webinar series that focused on what it means to have an intersectional approach to international criminal law specifically, with the participation of many people who are in this room and on the panel. It was part of our commitment to create a space for public discourse and dialogue on foundational issues that impact the quality of the work that we do. And in that vein, this side event is a continuation of that conversation. And today you'll hear the word intersectionality throughout uh, the intervention. So I thought I would take a brief moment just to define this term for those who may be slightly less familiar. Intersectionality is a lens, a methodology, and a practice that was coined by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989 to demonstrate that a single axis lens doesn't allow us to understand the multiple and overlapping root causes and systems that carry and maintain the discrimination, violence, and oppression that Black women experience in both work and domestic contexts, specifically in the United States, uh, but that can be extrapolated to much beyond that. Crenshaw illustrated how the experiences of Black women cannot be grasped in their entirety by looking through the single axis lens of gender because they're distinctly different from the discrimination faced by white women on the basis of their gender. And they are equally different from Black men on the basis of their race. So it's therefore a multi-axis lens that captures the experience of Black women on the basis of their race, their gender, and their class. So we're pleased to keep this important discussion going, and we hope that today will be the beginning of a deep reflection within the international justice community and the recognition that we need a major shift in the way that we do our work. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you have any questions specifically about the Emerging Justice Collective, you can find me or Lily, who is on the panel, and we would love to speak with you during the breaks throughout the week. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Over to you. Thank you very much. I think hearing the other panelists, I think I will be the least interesting speaker. Um, I will be very short. My name is Samuel Emone. I'm the Director of Justice Rapid Response. And um, I wanted to reflect briefly uh, as an opening remark about um, the work that we have done and how we have seen how intersectionality can be uh, relevant and important for the work that we do. Um, you need the, the, the hundreds of experts that we have been deploying to support uh, justice and accountability and, uh, and, and human rights investigation in the past few years. They have shown that many of these crimes and violations are driven by systems of discrimination, like multiple layers of uh, discriminating factors. And if you do not apply 
an intersection approach when you analyze those situations, there is a risk that you will miss a number of things that are really important throughout the justice process. I'm just going to mention three. Uh, the first one is that you risk overlooking crimes that are affecting certain people or group, which means that you will affect directly the investigation and the prosecution part of your work. There is a risk that you will not understand that those violations, they affect victims and survivors differently. And therefore, you will affect the whole reparation discussion for them. And the third dimension is, again, an example. There are many more. You might miss the underlying causes of the crimes and violations that happen, and you might affect the actual preventive effect of justice uh, from that point of view. So just giving you these three examples show how important it is to be able to apply that lens to the work throughout the justice process. So at Justice Rapid Response, I'm really happy to say that I'm proud to be having that event today with uh, our partners. Um, we have decided to systematically include this intersectional lens in the work of the experts that we are deploying to support justice and accountability actors. We have done so on SGBV, uh, on crimes affecting children, but we realize that we have to take that step further and really integrate that notion throughout. So we're really excited to hear uh, the panelists today and uh, to, to partner on that very important issue. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Samuel, and to all of our partners and sponsors that the event today. So our first panelist this evening was Patricia Bissell-Sellers. Uh, she is an international criminal lawyer, scholar, and advocate. She currently serves as the Special Advisor on Slavery Crimes at ICC and is a visiting fellow at Ella College at the University of Oxford. As a prosecutor at the Yugoslavia and Rwanda International Tribunals and as Special Advisor at the ICC, uh, she has developed the legal strategies that led to groundbreaking decisions recognizing sexual violence as constituting war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and other international crimes. This evening, Patty will help set the stage for this conversation by discussing the interplay between intersectional justice and slavery crimes. Over to you. Thank you very much, Carmen. I'd like to thank uh, Madam Ambassador, Australia, Colombia, and Argentina, and uh, also Carmen, Amanda, Lily. Thank you for organizing this, and Sam for the wonderful announcement that JRR is including intersectionality and in all of its projects going further. I would like to state one thing from the outset, that today we're talking about intersectionality as it relates to slavery crimes and not to the crime, the transnational crime of trafficking that the ambassador so very well laid out for us. This is a key part really of complementarity of the International Criminal Court that states use their own domestic laws such as trafficking or slave trading, since that is under the Australian Penal Code, or slavery to complement the work of the International Criminal Court. So I'm directing my remarks today to the specific crime of enslavement or slavery. Both historically and in contemporary times, the enslaved person, irrespective of age or gender, had intersectional vulnerabilities. And I would say that these intersectional vulnerabilities was a driver and became a definer of their type of enslavement. Let me give a couple examples. A historical example can be found in the Nuremberg Judgment. I know most people, and particularly those interested in intersectionality or gender, throw the Nuremberg Judgment away because it didn't mention the word rape. But would you just bear with me a little bit? Within the Norberg Judgment, it shows that during World War II, there was a deportation by the Nazi regime of more than 500,000 Polish women. They were deported, deported to slave labor as domestic workers in Germany. The women were vulnerable. Why? They were vulnerable racially because they were non-Aryan Poles. They were vulnerable because they lived in occupied Polish territory and were Polish citizens. And they were vulnerable because they were females. And thus, their enslavement destined them to become domestic slaves in the homes of their enemies. A more contemporary example of the intersectionalities that we find in slavery could be the boy 
who endured the crime of being a child soldier while simultaneously being an enslaved child and whose intersecting vulnerabilities of age or ethnicity and the very vulnerability of his gender being a boy drew, defined the parameters of his enslavement, as it does most contemporary instances of child soldiers or children who might across the desert. It is their age and often their gender, the reason that they were first sent out from home and the reason that they can be hoisted into enslavement. Slavery as defined under the Rome statute entails the exercise of any or all of the powers attaching to the rights of ownership over a person. And that can be de jure ownership or that can be de facto ownership. Cultural practices are a type of de facto ownership. This does include the trafficking of women and children, but as a description, not as a transnational crime. Because if there is trafficking that goes on, the Rome Statute has jurisdiction only if they can prove that very high threshold that someone has been exercising powers of ownership over the person. And sexual slavery is an enslaved person, often a female, who is caused to engage in an act of a sexual nature. Often that act is rape, and often we only see that lens when it's heteronormative rape. But the very exercise of ownership over a child or an adult is usually based upon their gender and based upon their intersecting vulnerabilities. And that can be whether these vulnerabilities are temporal or are long-term. The vulnerability could be endemic to the social, the economic, the ethnic, the race or the nationality, or the age of the enslaved person. Or the vulnerability could be very short time. It might be a relationship between two enemies where one has to succumb to the other and as enslaved. So the Rome Statute requires that the exercise of powers of ownership be established, whether it be in the process of selling, exchanging, or trafficking in persons. And proof of the exercise of powers of ownership over person is how the status of enslavement can be determined. The condition or status of being a slave is a continuing condition. Slavery is not punctual. The moment you are reduced to slavery begins the time span of the enslavement. And there's no minimum time requirement for slavery. It could be hours, it could be days, it could be years. And for many, it is a lifetime. Manifest intersecting vulnerabilities of the enslaved person not only allows us to identify and consist of evidence of enslavement and how the powers are, of ownership are exercised, they also give us another very important evidential start. It is these intersexual vulnerabilities that should not be disassociated, but rather that should assist us to reveal the patterns of conduct the practices, the policies, otherwise, the structured criminality of the perpetrator. I would call these forms of enslavement, slavery systems, such as the enslavement of adults and children to become porters or to work in mines, or the enslavement of children to become fighters. These are structures of the perpetrator's criminality. These are also the structures of how we see the disregard for protected persons under a war crime scenario, but even much more so, these structures reveal the widespread and systematic attacks during crimes against humanity. We should also not forget that these structures of enslavement can coexist. The enslavement of the Yazidi females, factually and legally, overlap with their genocide. Yes, enslavement can be a cumulative crime to other crimes. And this is how we understand a bit more of the perpetrator's mentality or the collective of perpetrators and their mentalities. These intersectional vulnerabilities determine the manner that the perpetrator constructs their criminal system, whether it be the acquisition of the slave, the use of the slave, or the further disposal of the slave. All of this is determined often by age, gender, abilities, and the perception of the eyes of the perpetrator. 
So the labor in the fields by Intaganda of Porters and Ongwen were the fighters in the field of Lobanga as child soldiers who were sources also of labor for the monetary ransom for migrants in Libya is indicia and evidence of vulnerabilities that reveal enslavement. Also the rewarding of fighters to have sexual access to slaves reveals a system and the evidence of enslavement. But each situation, as I say, is relying upon intersectional vulnerabilities. So how do these varied continual practices of slavery speak to us? They do because they reveal the perpetrator's ideology. They reveal more than motive, their evidence of intent. The girl child soldier, who in addition to age-related sexual vulnerabilities, now has vulnerabilities that might relate to her reproductive system. The vulnerabilities can increase during the periods of enslavement. Most children's vulnerabilities include the fact that now they would not know how to get home and they know that their family is not there. The increased vulnerabilities of migrants often is that the harsh conditions of transit must now be combined with them being deprived of any financial means and placing their families at a high risk to pay ransoms or to be threatened. And I would say among the most vulnerable of the vulnerabilities that slavery can show us is a newborn baby slave born from the enslaved mother. So I think it's imperative that we use an intersexual lens to look at the slavery crimes under the Rome Statute. And that's why I welcome the presentations of my <laughs> fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Patty, for setting the scene for us here. The, the next panelist today is Alexandra Lillard Cather, who is an international criminal lawyer. Their work is concerned with strengthening the investigation and prosecution of the intersectional dimensions of international crimes, including sexual violence. Lily's work contributed to advancing universal jurisdiction prosecutions in Germany, including of sexual crimes as crimes against humanity committed in government run detention facilities in Syria. Um, and the persecution on intersectional grounds of religion and gender against the CDs. They currently work with the Center for Justice and Accountability for Rights Watch, among other NGOs. This evening, Lily will discuss why intersectionality, intersectionality matters uh, in international criminal law. Lily, over to you. Thank you so much, Carmen. Um, thank you so very much to Australia, Colombia, and Argentina for supporting the site event. Thank you so much for your presence, uh, Ms. Ambassador. Um, also, thank you to the Global Justice Center, the Center for Justice and Accountability, and to Justice Rapid Response for co-hosting and co-convening this discussion with us. And thank you to each and every one of you for your presence um, today as well. Before diving into my remarks, I'd like to frame my own remarks by paying tribute to the outgoing special rapporteur on contemporary forms of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance, Tendai Achumi. In her latest, but also very last report dated 31st of October, 2022, she puts forward that there can be no meaningful mm -hmm. mitigation or resolution of the global ecological crisis without specific attention being paid to address systematic racism, in particular, the historic and contemporary racial legacies of colonialism and slavery. In analogy for this community of practice, I'd like to put forward that there can be no meaningful accountability, justice, and transformation as a result of the International Criminal Justice Project and ecosystem without spe specific action to address systematic racism, in particular, the historic and contemporary racial legacies of colonialism and slavery, including contemporary manifestation of slavery, both the slave trade and slavery crimes. And this is why I'm really particularly glad and honored that this discussion could take place at the Assembly of State Parties and with a particular look to look at slavery crimes, but also their intersectional dimension as an exercise and reflection for all of us to see why these uh, approaches are important and why we need them now. 
And in my remarks, concrete, concretely, I'd like to address two questions. Um, one is, what does intersectionality mean or can mean for our work as practitioners? And why does it matter for the broader ecosystem that is international criminal justice and the international court more specifically? So what does intersectionality mean in the context of our work? And we heard um, from Amanda earlier that it was indeed Professor Crenshaw who coined the term, but I would like to step a little bit before that and remind us that even before this, this term was coined, and before anti-discrimination, intersecting anti-discrimination issues were litigated in the courts of law in the United States, we saw grassroots social movements um, and collectives such as the Combahee River Collective that really had um, their intersectional liberation demands at, at the heart of their very own struggles. And we also need to remember that among them were groups and collectivities that were that were and that are until this day affected by coloniality. And with coloniality, I refer to the theory and the idea and the concept that colonialism is not a close historical event, but is an ongoing process of social and political domination that is ongoing until this day. Among the groups that saw intersectionality not as a theoretical concept or lens, but really at the heart of their struggle, were also collectivities and groups that um, are and were affected by what Satija Hartman calls the afterlife of slavery. And she calls the afterlife of slavery because she refers to slavery as, again, not something that has ended, but is something with long and unfinished aftermath and consequences. What these two examples also shows us is that there are interwoven systems of social and political um, domination that are all among us. Um, these include white supremacy, capitalism, patriarchy, xenophobia, homophobia, ableism, or transphobia. And these lie at the root of the violence we are seeing in our everyday. These are the structural drivers of the violence we are seeing every day. But these are also the structural drivers at the root of the mass violence that are under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, including contemporary manifestation of slavery crimes in, for example, Uganda, Libya, or Ukraine. So why does it matter for the ecosystem that is international criminal justice and the International Criminal Court to be concerned with a multi-axis lens to understanding harm instead of a single axis harm? And I put forward two points. I think it matters on the one hand for the substantive work we are doing in investigating and prosecuting international crimes. And that both in, in the International Criminal Court, but also increasingly we see domestic investigations and prosecutions on the university jurisdiction happening in third states. So it matters also for, for practitioners on the domestic level. And the second side to that coin is I think intersectionality can guide us not just what we work on, but how we work on one another and how we can make sure that these systems of social and political dominance are not reproduced in the way we relate to one another in doing this work. By we, I mean how the court speaks and acts with civil society organizations, how internationalized and governmental organizations relate and work with. Um, organizations and activists and survivor communities from the affected situation countries. I think there's a lot that can be learned from intersectionality if we understand it as systems of oppression that are alive which, with each and every one of us. Returning to the substantive work, um, intersectionality matters because, as Patricia Rousseau Sella said, it's really the harm to the collectivity that international criminal law aims to protect. And the collectivity is or are the racial, national, ethnic, and religious groups under genocide, the civilian population under crimes against humanity, and the protected groups under war crimes, among them civilians, those who have laid down their arms, the wounded, and the shipwrecked. But we have to realize that these groups are never homogenous. Civilians are never a homogenous group. Children are never a homogenous group. The wounded and the shipwrecked are never an homogenous group. So how does a single access lens serve us? And what is our responsibility in not 
making sure a homogenous narrative is being told and a part of the history is being left out. So how do we do that? Intersectionality is not something that starts at some point and ends at one another. I think um, there, there are two academics, Nikita Davan and Maria do Castro Dama, um, who really understood intersectionality as a corrective methodology, a lens that can help us understand why certain inequalities, why certain harms are given more spaces, more time, more resources in certain spaces at a certain time. And what I propose as a first step is that we as a community of practice engage in an intersectional lens of review. And that may be a very first step to identify where we have maybe applied a single access lens and where that has led to shortcomings. It may help us to identify where we are simply looking at the harm, for example, enslavement, but not its structural drivers of racial and gender dominance, both historically and at this point in time. I also put forward that intersectionality in an intersectional review matters because according to the Rome Statute, Article 21.3, we are asked, or the judges are asked, to interpret and apply the law consistent with international human rights law and without any adverse distinction on several grounds um, that can also be in an intersecting manner. So adherence to this article, in my opinion, explicitly asks us for an intersectional approach to this work, to the work of judges, but prior to that, to the work of investigators, analysts, and prosecutors, but also civil society actors, and quite frankly, any actor that contributes in any form to the functioning of the court or the international criminal justice ecosystem. Despite this, however, there's still a challenge to see intersectional approaches as a legitimate um, take on this kind of work. So starting from the investigation, an intersectional lens to investigation recognizes that there are not just harms occurring, but that these harms occur in a certain context, mm -hmm. and that that context comes with very specific historic, but also present forms of social and political domination. And what I'm putting forward is to really investigate these systems of political and social uh, domination more explicitly from the very beginning of the investigations and to understand this information as part of your evidence, contextual evidence, but also more broadly. How can we understand the harm if we don't pay, pay equal attention to the context in which the harm truly occurred? And in closing, I'd like to um, point out two things. I think we heard earlier today during the opening, but also during the launch of the OTP's annual report that there is a continuous need to support the International Criminal Court and the broader ecosystem around it. And that it's very critical that states continuously provide resources, but also that they adopt and strengthen their own legislation so that they are able um, and with institutional and care support for communities around to advance accountability for international crimes alongside the International Criminal Court. By the same token, I think it's really um, also an appropriate time to openly speak about the fact that what we practice at the small scale sets the pattern for the whole system, and that's a quote by Adrian Marie Brown. So it is really encouraging to see that workplace culture and workplace discrimination becomes openly part of these conversations. But what does not become part of these conversations yet is that workplace culture and discrimination is not without link to the work that we are doing and its impact. So I think we need to speak more openly also about the colonial legacies of international law as well as the colonial legacies of international criminal law and our role within that. And lastly, also the recognition, and this is not to dismiss any institution or any person, the Rome Statute is a punitive carceral instrument and institution. An intersectional approach to international justice work and cooperation asks us and those who fund the work to create a breathing space for conversation about restorative justice systems and processes that are led by affected persons and communities. 
And this is not an either or equation, but it's an equation that asks for an equitable distribution of resources and that we need both. We need to hold persons accountable, but by the same token, we need to break, create honest breathing spaces for people to be able to speak about what they need at one point in time and not artificially prioritize one over the other. And these spaces would include reparations and restorative justice measures more broadly that are not tied to outcomes of punitive and carceral legal proceedings. Thank you very much, Lily, for helping us think through what an intersectional practice of ICL may look like. Our next panelist is uh, Priya Narayan. Um, she has been in appeals counsel with the Appeals and Prosecution Legal Coordination Section of the ICC Office of the Prosecutor since 2014. She began her international criminal law journey at the ICTR in 2005, working first for Chambers and then later as appeals counsel for the prosecution. She has also worked as legal officer to the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Priya has also previously worked in India on legislation, policy, and legal aid on gender and human rights. This evening, she's going to speak on intersectionality and slavery crimes at, in ICC case law, uh, the past, the present, and the future. Priya, over to you. Thank you so much, and uh, good evening to everyone. Um, thank you for hosting this event, and thank you for having me. So it's a great privilege. Um, today, in my time, I'm going to try to um, look at ICC case law on slavery crimes and intersectionality and try to offer a few practical insights uh, that we may take from that case law, um, of course, with the view of you know, going forward. Uh, but first, on the concept of intersectionality itself, uh, in 2021, uh, the trial chamber in Interganga in the context of the reparations discussion, uh, and when they, when they wish to set out a gender inclusive approach to reparations, they expressly use the term intersectionality. Uh, and when they did that, uh, of course, to explain what it meant, uh, they relied on the writings of Kimberly Crenshaw, of uh, the case law of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, as well as uh, some documents of note from the United Nations, including the UNSG's uh, guidance on conflict-related sexual violence. Um, but of course, since then, the Appeals Chamber has partially overturned that decision, but not expressly on that point, as I understand. But nonetheless, there are very few express overt references to intersectionality in the ICC's own case law. But when we look at the underlying facts and when we look at the conduct uh, that the cases are based on, you can see shades and glimpses of an intersectional approach. And that's what I'd like to try to talk about uh, briefly today in my time. Uh, now, first, uh, when we look at, of course, the past, and that I think is the early phase of the ICC, uh, to me, that would be characterized by a case like, say, for example, Lubanga, where you have a relatively a uh, limited discussion on slavery crimes per se and aspects of intersectionality, but the underlying facts tell a different story. So in Lubanga, and I'm sure everyone knows this, the charge was that of conscripting enlistment and use of child soldiers. Uh, but Judge Odio Benito, when she dissented, uh, she expressly found that the sexual violence and some aspects of the enslavement had been made invisible in that case. Uh, and she applied an intersectional approach, emphasizing both the age and the, uh, the uh, gender of the victims. Uh, she found that sexual violence was actually a core component of the criminal conduct. And taking it further, she also um, highlighted the differential impact on the girls, uh, including uh, the, the fact that uh, they were used as slaves, uh, as so-called wives, um, and also on uh, she highlighted the gender-specific impact, including uh, unwanted pregnancies, HIV, psychological trauma, stigma, etc. So when you look at that phase, um, the takeaway, uh, could there could be a couple of takeaways. Uh, first, uh, under the ICC statute, 
slavery crimes or crimes that reflect aspects of slavery or enslavement are not necessarily those crimes, uh, or rather, they are not limited to those crimes that have the word slavery in them. Uh, there could be other crimes. So, for example, in Lubanga, the child soldier crimes definitely had an aspect of enslavement. Um, but, but just with a with a note of caution, uh, that uh, to to prove uh, the uh, the exercise of the powers of ownership, uh, the victim doesn't necessarily have to be a child soldier. That's one way, but there are many others. Uh, the second takeaway, of course, I mean, and these are obvious, um, applying the intersectional analysis is essential to uh, completely convey the nature of the harm, the cumulative unique nature of the discrimination that follows from a combination of factors such as age, gender, ethnicity, etc. And of course, an intersectional analysis must be part and parcel of the, anal uh, of the analysis right from the beginning. Uh, and Lubanga is a good reminder of that. Uh, when we move to, let's say, the second phase, which uh, to my mind would be the present and characterized by cases like Interganda and Onguin, uh, we do see a greater use of uh, slavery crimes per se within the charges uh, and also aspects of intersectionality. Uh, so, for example, in Interganda, as many of you will know, among the charges were uh, sexual slavery of girls and women captured by the UPCFPLC, and also of girls uh, under the age of 15 within the UPCFPLC. But what Interganda gave us, and this builds on what the Katanga Chamber had done previously, is a list of non-exhaustive criteria uh, which can be used uh, to demonstrate the exercise of powers of ownership. And this can potentially be a very powerful tool uh, in, in cases of enslavement and slavery. Uh, mm -hmm. Among that list uh, are indicators that relate to restrictions on movement, control of sexuality, denial of sexual and reproductive autonomy, uh, as well as other aspects relating to vulnerability, including socioeconomic conditions. So um, when we look at cases like that, um, the takeaway potentially is uh, while the list is tremendously useful, um, I think one needs to remember not to look at each indicator in the silo or on their own. What we need to look at is uh, the indicators in conjunction, in combination with each other. Uh, remembering, of course, that the value of an intersection analysis is that it's greater than the sum of its parts in many ways. Um, so, for example, if you take uh, an indicator like the control of sexuality, which is a, a very important indicator uh, in cases of enslavement, um, especially, for example, to show the sexualized ownership over children uh, in cases of enslavement, um, if you look at that in this year, in uh, conjunction with, let's say, uh, the victim's own vulnerability or even poverty, that gives you a very different and expanded understanding of enslavement in that case. Uh, so that could be one takeaway. Another takeaway, of course, is um, to consider the scope of exploring uh, different aspects of vulnerability, including cases that do not relate to sexual violence. Um, this, of course, brings us to Ongwen. Um, since the matter is before the appeals chamber at the moment, uh, I won't say much, uh, except to say that, uh, of course, in Ongwen, uh, there is a question of both enslavement and sexual slavery, and the appeals chamber's guidance on these crimes will be very useful going forward in future cases. Um, this, of course, then brings me to where we currently stand with intersectionality and slavery crimes uh, within the ICC's own case law. Uh, but I'd also just briefly like to flag that there are interesting conversations on intersectionality also in the context of persecution, which, of course, can be highly relevant to the crime of enslavement and, and slavery under the ICC statute. Uh, so you will find that in all the recent cases on persecution, there are uh, shades of an intersectional approach. So, for example, in Al-Hassan, the uh, charges of persecution uh, alleged um, with respect to the women uh, covers both religion and gender, the operative word being and. 
Um, and then, for example, in Abdel Rahman, uh, which is the case relating to the situation in Sudan, again, the charges relate to political, ethnic, and gender grounds. And in our view, the, these multiple intersecting um, ways in which to present the charge was really the only way to properly demonstrate the full um, aspect of the victimization in that in those cases. Um, now, looking to the future, and I'm sure you know the discussion will go there as well. Uh, but there would be, uh, in my view, um, potential to explore the full scope of enslavement um, uh, and slavery under the ICC statute. And this can be done in a variety of ways. Um, one, um, let's to be alert to the different conduct and um, uh, that can be relevant to enslavement and sexual slavery. Um, and this, in, in some ways, we need to be aware of their historical origins, but we also need to be able to keep up with new and emerging conduct as well. So both of them. Uh, we also need to, I think, learn um, to look beyond the obvious. And as, as we said, um, a slavery crime is not necessarily only the crime that has the word slavery in it. And the ICC statute has great potential uh, to reflect various aspects of, of enslavement, including uh, in the crimes of uh, persecution, uh, forced marriage is another inhumane act, um, forced pregnancy, including particularly the aspects of unlawful confinement, uh, as well as three other forms of sexual violence, and also, of course, child social crimes, and there could be others, of course. Uh, lastly, I mean, I just only like to say that uh, with respect to enslavement and slavery, there are, of course, some aspects uh, that are not expressly criminalized under the ICC statute. Um, but can we look at other ways in which we can use the existing toolkit to also reflect those crimes? So that's just something to, to think about for the future. Uh, but otherwise, I really look forward to uh, listening to what you might also have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Priya, for uh, packing what intersectional analysis might look like in practice. Um, that's very helpful. And so our final panelist for this evening is uh, Angela McBeauty. Um, from um, the Global Justice Center, where she is a senior legal advisor. Uh, Angela is a Zimbabwean international criminal justice, a criminal justice lawyer with over 13 years of experience in ICL and human rights. She has worked for a number of organizations, including OSF, Human Rights Watch, the ICC, and the Southern Africa Litigation Center, where she focused on strategic litigation, including seeking the arrest of the former president of Sudan during his visit to South Africa and using universal jurisdiction to investigate and prosecute crimes against humanity before the highest courts in South Africa. This evening, Angela, is a, Angela will discuss the importance of representation in international criminal justice, particularly, particularly at the ICC. Thank you, Carmen, and thank you all for being here. It's wonderful to see so many people despite the number of events that happen in parallel at the ASP, so thank you. And the Global Justice Center is very happy to be co-hosting with our great partners on this panel. So we've heard about intersectionality and the importance of building that into our approach to ICL. And there are, of course, several ways to do this, but one of the most important ways in my view, and this will be the center of my remarks today, is representation and diversity in teams, in leadership, and in staff composition at the ICC. And that means everything from investigators to analysts, cooperation advisors, prosecutors, defense attorneys, legal officers, and judges. Representation and diversity at every stage of the criminal justice process is key. Of course, there are many groups at the ICC that are underrepresented or not represented at all. And whilst I'll focus my remarks on gender balance and geographical representation, I'd like us to bear that in mind. The issue of poor representation is not limited to the groups I'm going to discuss today, but we need the numbers and the statistics to give us a genuine idea of the situation. For example, there is no publicly available race disaggregated data from the ICC. The ASB report on gender balance and geographical representation speaks of men and women only and no other gender identities. I hope this is something that will change in the future. But looking at the ICC and looking at the information we have, let's ask ourselves a few questions. Are there people of color? If so, how many and which positions do they hold? Are there women? 
If so, how many and which positions do they hold? Where are all these people from? Are they all from the global north? Unfortunately, the answer to these questions does not paint a very positive picture. Starting with gender diversity at the ICC, as of July 2021, according to the ASB report on gender balance and geographical representation, female staff comprised 48.1% of the court's professional staff. Male staff, 51.9. Sounds okay, it's not great, but it's okay. But when we dig deeper, that's when we see the problems. 81% of these women are in lower level positions. So at D1, we have as director level, we have one woman and eight men. P5, we have 10 women and 30, three zero men. P4, we have 32 women and 50, five zero men. Geographical representation, also not great. As of 2021, out of the 473 professional staff at the ICC, 256 of them are from Western Europe and other states. More than half of the ICC staff are from one region, one out of five regions. Let's break that down even further and look at who holds the most senior positions at the court. 55.6% of the director level positions are held by people from Western Europe. 72% of the P5 positions are held by people from Western Europe. And 56% of the people positions are held from, by people from Western Europe. So it's not just about having diversity in numbers, but it's also about having diversity in the ranks as well. We look at the ASP bodies, we're not doing much better there either. For example, the Committee on the Election of the Prosecutor appointed in 2019, there were four men and one woman. The panel of experts appointed to help them, there were three men and only two women. The current advisory committee on the nomination of judges. There are nine members and only three of them are women. The ICC has had seven ASP presidents since its inception and only two of them have been women. Currently, if you look at the bench, we've got nine women, nine men, great. But prior to that, at the beginning of 2020, it was the sixth consecutive year that female judges were outnumbered by male judges. In fact, in early 2020, there were 12 male judges and only six female judges. Now, this is not just about showing you what the numbers are, but it's also about showing the impact of this imbalance. And we see that there are consequences both internally and externally at the ICC. Internally, we know that the workplace culture is dictated, controlled, and determined by the majority. In this case, men from the global north. We know from the independent expert review report, and I quote, men exert enormous influence and weight, not merely over the substantive work of the court, but how it's organized over recruitment and placements and other staffing decisions that impact officers at all levels. We also know from the independent expert review that sexual harassment and bullying are rife at the ICC. And I quote yet again, the experts heard a number of accounts of sexual harassment, notably uninvited, unwanted sexual advances from more senior male staff to their female subordinates. <laughs> That's internally. Externally, we also have consequences. Optics. Not only is it not good, but it doesn't look good. And this in turn affects the legitimacy of the court. For example, we've all heard the criticism of the ICC being a neo-colonial institution targeting Africans. Now, whether you consider that to be true or not is neither here nor there, but it's a widely held perception. And having predominantly white or male leadership from the global north is not helping address this perception. It also affects how cases are approached and how work is done. We have all heard of cultural insensitivity that has come with fraught ICC outreach policies or investigative teams that are not diverse. Think of the impact this has on the witness or survivors who are already in a vulnerable space, never mind being questioned by someone who's perhaps too far removed from your context to ask the right questions and to treat you in a way that is respectful. You need to ask the right questions to get all the information. And if your questions are homogenized, stereotypical, and non-intersexual in framing, your case is inadequate from the very, very beginning. And that, in turn, leads to a failure to fully address the harm suffered by survivors and victims. It also affects the court's legacy. 
how will the court be remembered? How will other international criminal justice initiatives be viewed if the situation of the ICC does not change? For example, there are increase, there's increasing skepticism from many countries in the global south when new initiatives are designed to provide justice for core international crimes because of the ICC's track record and legacy. Many states are reluctant to sign this new treaty or join that new convention for this very reason. So again, whether we think it's a justified reason to refuse to join a new treaty or new convention is not the point, but the point is these issues have to be addressed because they're having a negative impact on international criminal justice as a whole. Of course, I'd be remiss not to mention that the court is working on improving the situation. We know there's a gender focal point who was appointed. There's been relevant training, for example, dealing with unconscious bias and recruitment. And there's also the launch of the strategy on gender equality and workplace culture this week. And these are fantastic developments, and those who are behind these developments need to be encouraged and supported. But one of the most important things that has to change at the court, and there's great resistance to this, is term limits. We have term limits for elected officials, but not for staff. We also know from the IER report that 44% of the D staff have been there for more than 10 years. And as we've already established, men from Western Europe hold these positions and they have to vacate these positions to make space for other people. The ICC needs term limits for staff. And we know this works at other organizations like the OBCW just down the road, their term limits there for everybody. And I'm not suggesting that this is easy or painless. It's complicated and it will cause a great deal of discomfort for many people, but it needs to be seriously considered. I was pleased to hear this morning that the IER recommendation on tenure is actually moving forward it was in the ASB, so I hope something comes from that. Tenure is one thing, but there's also structural inequality that's inherently built into the system. I'll give you one example. The 2007 ASB resolution, and I quote, in accordance with this resolution, the court's selection of professional staff is guided by the system of desirable ranges based on that of the UN. The desirable ranges are calculated considering three factors. The total number of states' parties, a state's party's financial contribution, and its population size. Now, at the present moment, the greatest importance is given to a state's financial contribution. So this is inherently unfair and prejudicial because capable, experienced, potential employees from states that are not in the same financial position as those from the global north will not get hired because your state's financial contribution is a major factor that's considered when people are hired. It's time to change the system. Because if we don't, then we'll continue to have the numbers that I presented to you today. And if the ICC does not seriously and urgently address this, we'll continue to exclude perspectives and expertise that should undoubtedly be part of our approach to international justice. Maintaining the status quo replicates patterns of colonial and neo-colonial patriarchal thinking. The lives and experiences of women, people of color, people from the global south, and other people from underrepresented groups should be included in every aspect of the ICC's work. And to conclude, I'll just leave you with a few recommendations. And these came out of the UN 2021 uh, Human Rights Advisory Council report on gender balance. Now, it is specific to gender balance, but I think it applies to some of the other imbalances I've mentioned today. Things like setting aspirational targets. And if these aspirational targets are not met, holding decision makers accountable, at least by requiring explanations as to why these targets were not met. Changing hiring practices more training on unconscious bias, et cetera. I'll leave it there. But in conclusion, I just want to say something that Ava DuVernay says very well. She says, when we're talking about diversity, it's not a box to check. It's a reality that should be deeply felt and held and valued by all of us. The ICC should be no exception. Thank you. Thank you to Angela for that very sober assessment and to all of our panelists for their presentations. Uh, we now have some time for questions um, from the audience. Uh, if you do have a question, I encourage you to please use a microphone because this is being recorded and that will help a lot. Um, and in asking your question, it would also be helpful if you can just, um, just introduce yourself, um, tell us your name and where you're coming from. So are there any questions from the audience?
So, uh, oh, sorry, Layla Sagan, um, Washington University, and also um, Special Advisor on Crimes Against Humanity. And I was so thrilled by this. Uh, all the presentations were so interesting. And um, I, I have one, I, I just have one question, which is really maybe for Patty and for all of you, actually which is thinking technically about intersectionality and, and slavery. Um, I want to go back to what Priya said with respect to Nidaganda, because it really came up in the Nidaganda case, and it came up in the question of who is a civilian in that case. And this is where some of the conversation about who's in the room deciding what to charge is relevant, which it was also relevant with Lubanga. Because one of the things that's always troubled me, and Patty, maybe you can speak to this too, is when you have individuals abducted and taken into a rebel force, and either forced to fight or enslaved in some way, mistreated in other ways, it's always bothered me that they lost their IHL status, their civilian status. And the Nidaganda case only admitted that it could treat as war crimes, um, basically sexual violence against kids under 15 that were taken into the, the uh, force. And I think if you think about what happens when individuals are abducted from their village and taken into a rebel force, the fact that they can then be, some of them might be protected by crimes against humanity law, but some of them would not be protected either by crimes against humanity or war crimes because they just fall into the cracks there. They're no longer civilians and they're not protected by the laws and customs of war. That's always struck me as a really painful gap in, uh, in our framework. And I just wonder if um, I, I've had these conversations over more than a decade actually with folks inside the office. And I just wonder if that's something you could speak to about how do we overcome that problem of victimization that just doesn't fit our framework because our framework is insufficiently uh, intersectional, if I can borrow Kim uh, Crenshaw's uh, typology. So thank you, and fabulous presentation. And Angela, all I can hope is that we get lots more money <laughs> and we can just hire lots more staff and we can help the imbalance there rather than waiting for the tender policy. So, um, Thank you, Leila. Do you want to yeah, say and then Priya. <laughs> Leila, I think you you identified what I call one of the structure deficiencies in, in the statute. And so I think the special court for Sierra Leone looked at that issue and said, well, children should come under crimes against humanity. They're part of the civilian population. And you can see in Taganda, one of the struggles they have and that they should have, even if they move beyond the status of protected status. Uh, by saying the framework of international law is different, is that you have a group of, of people, uh, yeah. let's say below the 15-year-old range, children, who are in a situation that they can't consent to. You can't consent to whether you're conscripted or illicit. You're, you're in a non-consensual situation per se. And then uh, you might have a sexual slavery that you have to endure, which is a non-consensual situation uh, per se, also, and right under those uh, course of circumstances. So here the child is in three different situations where there is no ability to even uh, countenance any type of legal consent. And the result would be that they would lose their any status of protection. I think it has to do with historical abnormality of um, children being recruited or enlisted, conscripted, and then um, actively engaging in hostilities comes to us out of customary law and then joins the protocols. And I think that they didn't fill the different gaps as they were making this type of positive law customary. Thank you for coming out to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, I don't think I can add to that. I think about Patty. I just bug you with one follow-up. What about the 15 to 18? Those were the ones that really bothered us, right? They're still kids. Mm -hmm. I think they're enslaved. Yeah, I, I would offer that they're enslaved uh, children, even if they're not under the technicalities of uh, child uh, soldiering. 
or there are persons who are being you know, tortured and being treated, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, Thank you, good night to all. Uh, Fabiola Cruz from the Embassy of Bolivia. Uh, really, I, I'm, I'm really thankful for all the information we have received today. Uh, I have a comment and also a question. Uh, this intersectionality is a, is a method I understand that it helps us to understand the whole picture. Everything. But um, maybe we can, uh, we can, but the, mo the most, uh, the factor that affects most uh, to the ICC and also to the victims are more gender. So maybe in the only to say intersectionality, we have I think we have to take care that this gender the gender problem doesn't doesn't disappear uh, only in the intersectionality. I'm talking as a woman and also as a, a as a, a as a citizen of a, a less representative uh, a, con a, Area that is uh, Latin America, so uh, that is uh, it is not only the matter of being of uh, of color of not, but uh, uh, there are uh, another ways that the discrimination can be filled, and also inside the ICC, and also with all the 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 work the ICC can the ICC can do. And my question is, uh, what are the we know this? We we have been talking about. Almost every year, sort of. So, uh, what do you think they are the, the strategies that can be uh, more useful for for this issue that we can we can change the term? We can say intersectionality, gender balance, geographical representation that our that they are our principles. But uh, what do you think can be the most uh, a, a strategic uh, action plan that can yeah, can can change this this issue that we 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 talk to this uh, almost every year. Thank you for your question and your comment. Um, I, I can't see fully down the road. I see you might want to take this, but okay. How about Angela? Then I I don't know, Lily. Did you want to come around this as well? Okay. okay. Thank you. It's a very good question. I think the first one would be. The resolution that states you need to give precedence to a state's financial contribution has got to go. That's got to change. And I know there will be a lot of unhappy people because that's what the system is built on. It's built on how much money do you give to the court, therefore your nationals will be represented. I don't think that's sustainable. And I know this is something that the Rome Statute takes from the UN system, but just because it comes from the UN system doesn't mean it's good. It also has to change. So that would be my biggest one, number one. And then I think number two, Tenure, and I know we're waiting for the implementation of the IER recommendation next year, but I don't think we should be waiting for these things. There are people who've been at the court since it started, and I'm all for institutional memory and, and that sort of thing, but I do think we need fresh thinking and we need to rotate and people need to move out and up and other people need to come in. And I think that's got to happen, not next year, not the year after, but we need to start thinking about that now, obviously, with due respect to people's labor rights and, and all the implications of that. So those would be my two primary suggestions for this. Thank you, Angela. Does anyone else want to come in on the question or the comment? I just want to comment just with a follow-up question for the room. And that question is, why has gender been a struggle and a fight, but also the most palatable driver of structural violence in this area of practice? And that means, I think, an intersectional approach can invite us to expand our thinking on that and our own journey of unlearning and reflection why that is the case. It is commendable Veronique's work um, continues, continuing the legacy of children. But again, how do we not build silos and also institutionally, right? How do we collaborate more with one another? We have a head the gender and children unit, right? But how do we have in intersectional approaches institutionalized in this work? And this isn't to make gender go away, but to if really those that are affected by, by discrimination and by structural violence on grounds of gender, a space um, and, and access to justice that, that they deserve in, in their most holistic, um, in the most holistic way. So yeah, I hope that. 
I'll have further reflection on this. Thank you, Lily and friend. Yeah, thank you so much, Lily. I was actually just uh, having quite a lot of thoughts about the presentations um, that I've heard. Um, and uh, I can't agree more than what you've just been saying, Lily, in terms of avoiding silos. And when we look at um, gender in the context of intersectionality, I think with children, I mean, I prefer to refrain using the term children I use under 18 from the age of birth to adolescence. Uh, because the problem with children is, you know, in the mind, there is very often this picture of this, you know, and uh, there is nothing more different in the development of uh, the brain and physical development and emotional development of an individual, but the, the way it happens during the first 18 years and add complexity in the intersectional dimension of the gender, but it's also the educational level, it's also the, the maturity and the capacity to engage in justice and so forth and so forth. Uh, um, and with regard to <clears throat> looking at gender uh, persecution and the intersectional dimension, and, and there's a qu the question of um, a slavery. I, I basically have two questions. One is um, how much has been a look at um, one category at least for under 18, that is very, very rarely looked at in situation of armed conflict is uh, the um, persecution and discrimination against LGBTQ plus uh, under 18 uh, from all different gender. And I have a presentation to make in a few days. So if anyone's got some <laughs> words of research, <laughs> uh, I'm welcoming because this is the second year that I'm supposed to present. And uh, there is a uh, very, very, very little. So that's that's one thing. And the other thing with uh, slavery crime, um, I'd like to go again back to, to Patty with regard to this question of under 18 and uh, how do you approach uh, in, uh, in multidimensional, intersectional, dimensional approach of uh, under 18 slavery crime. Right, well, I think the fact that the person is under 18 at times, as I stated before, might even drive the type of enslavement that they're reduced to. Um, because the under 18 year old is not yet the psychological mentality of an adult, but be, might be physically able to do more things than a younger child. So sometimes that very age group drives the type of enslavement they might have. And I'd like to offer um, a historical example that might not be completely analogous today. But within um, uh, the Arab slave trade, which could be called the East Africa slave trade, not the West Africa slave trade, they in particular wanted boys who were between 14 and 16. And those boys, unfortunately, while being slave traded prior to reaching uh, homes in the Ottoman Empire, those, those boys were castrated so that they could become eunuchs. And therefore, their slavery function was to oversee the harems of females who were sexually enslaved. So you have the enslaved guarding the enslaved, mm -hmm. and both were uh, sexually enslaved and sexually altered. But they in particular wanted that age group below 18, the 14 to 16, 17 years. Now, we have to, I think, as Priya said, you know, have historical awareness, but also to look forward, see what new types of enslavement could be encroaching on that age group and on a sexual or sexual orientation group also, such as possibly the Basha boys from Afghanistan might fit into that age category in terms of a different form of sexualized enslavement. Thank you. Um, Irani, for just the benefit of the recording, could you uh, just introduce yourself quickly? Yes, I'm very sorry. Uh, I'm the leader of um, Conflict Assist in the UK for the last 10 years, and I'm also special advisor to the SEC prosecutor on crimes against and affecting children. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. I'm always terrified using these mics. Um, I'm Jennifer Keane McCann. I am from the Asia Justice Coalition. Um, and in that capacity, thank you, thank you, thank you for this presentation, your presentations, your thoughts. 
I'm very excited to be thinking about these different strategies and approaches. It feels very refreshing to me. Um, as we think about intersectionality and the crimes, um, what does thinking about intersectionality and defenses in relation to slavery do? And I'm thinking about um, non-prosecution, non-punishment uh, principles in relation to trafficking. So that, do we also think about how that impacts um, our defenses that we use in the international justice system? Well, I'm not certain if this will come anywhere close to answering your question. We caveat with that. But because trafficking is a different crime with different elements uh, that have to be proven, and it's a transnational crime, it's the equivalent of uh, drug trafficking, uh, organized crime to gun running. And so the elements of trafficking are different than the elements of enslavement and even uh, slave trading. Under trafficking, you do not have to prove exercising any or all the powers of ownership over the person. And under trafficking, depending on whether there's coercion or force, an adult um, person who's been trafficked might not have to show that there was no consent, and only the child under 12 uh, has per se non-consent under trafficking. Under slavery and slave trading, uh, consent is legally irrelevant, period. And slavery, slave trading, it does not have an age basis in terms of who can qualify for certain defenses or not. And there is no requirement of, of force coercion or anything under slavery and slave crime. So they're, by their very nature, they're very different. But I think slightly getting to what you've raised is when one looks at the intersectionalities that the traffic survivor embodies, like as I tried to say before, this is a reflection of the power structure that the trafficker wanted to place or utilize on top of the survivor and created part of their, um, uh, either their trafficking system, but with their end result of having to be reduced to an exploitation. So I think what we can get from that is a reflection of, of how the organized crime operates and what is the modus operandi for going after certain persons as opposed to other persons. And also to maintain the system. Thank you. <laughs> <Long time. laughs> well, all the I'm Kim Chui Sealing. Sure. Um, I work with Layla at Washington University. I'm also a special advisor on sexual violence and conflict. And these are some very, very old friends. So amazing to listen to you and learn from you tonight. Um, I'm just listening to your question and Patty's response, and it struck me that that other piece of it is the way we understand perpetrators themselves, right? And what do we do with the fact that Coyello or Ongwen were child soldiers and abducted when they were 13 and have a different understanding of family and a moral compass? And how does that affect our thinking about defense or sentencing and then clarity on that? But then so many other situations and contexts right now where we have at least particularly lower level perpetrators who are marginalized and forced into combat positions with recruitment. Um, I don't have an argument. I'll, I'll go with Patty. I'm not sure this is an answer for you, but, yeah. but it, it does add complexity to how we understand the dynamics and the false duality or victimhood and perpetration, actually. And so intersectionality, I think, needs to be applied across the way. Another piece that I would mention is the value and um, of stepping outside of ourselves to understand what those intersection components even are. Right? We name, we say things like gender and age and all But we understand those things from where we sit as individuals and as people who come from where we come from. And so I think having some humility as you know a core or whatever institution may be. Um, we represent what can we learn from civil society? What can we learn from just local communities that aren't organized in traditional ways? What can we learn from academia? You know, when you said Bajabazi, Patty, I read the most interesting article last week about Bajaposh, which is girls mm -hmm. in Afghanistan, right? It's 
it, it's a different side of the coin that I had never heard of it before, and I'm in academia. And so I think learning to understand intersectionality from sort of intersecting lenses and fields also, I think, can really enrich our analysis. And that's all. And it's really, really nice to see all of you. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Anyone like to respond to that? Please give them the article. <laughs> I'd like to maybe connect the dots between what you raised and also what Angela said, and like how can we move as a community of practice, not from deciding over to deciding with. And how can we do that, right? And who who needs to be part of our team? Who do we need to consult? And with what capacity? And yeah, how do we do that at, at, at every step of the way? Because there's so much theorizing of harm that would be very hard to find a transformative value in accounting for it if it's removed from the very people and community and places and wish it occurred. And it's nice to see you too, Kim. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else from the audience? Well, I want to thank the audience um, for their very rich and interesting questions. Um, oh, it's so obvious that there are so many experts in our audience who are equally visiting up here with us too. Um, so that's just very exciting to see. So um, I, I'd like to hand things over now to uh, an ambassador again um, to provide some concluding observations before we end tonight. This is where I say thank you for choosing the non-expert to sum up the <laughs> presentation. But, but I will give it a go. Having learned a great deal from, from today's sessions, I want to thank everyone for uh, incredibly interesting, thought-provoking um, commentary. If I can sort of uh, sum up perhaps uh, a few of the things that, that we heard and, and dwell on, which I'll try and do. So we started off with, uh, with a discussion of what does intersectionality mean and then how does that have relevance to uh, the royal statute, the cases that have been tried, past, present and future. And I think what I took from everyone's really thoughtful presentations was uh, just a simple statement, and apologies if it sounds... Uh, Bit banal, but um, a single access lens does not allow us to understand the context, the victim, or the perpetrator. And I think that last question that we had brought that back to bear. Actually, that that we actually need to think about uh, the crimes, the statute, uh, and the people, uh, both investigating and responding to the whole case in a different kind of way. Um, Inter intersectional lens is needed to the investigations. Uh, how can we understand a crime if we don't understand the context? And uh, reference to the long implications of colonial slavery as well. Uh, we learnt a bit about the way that, that past, present cases uh, have looked at different acts, different approaches, different sort of elements of intersectionality and some hints as to how we might be approaching these uh, in the future. And then I think we had what was really uh, a very a very clear and in some ways a, a bit disturbing sort of uh, assessment of statistics from Angela on, on the ICC. And if I can bring back uh, to my own sort of comments at the beginning, then a look at how can we actually address not just some of the problems within the organisation here, but within the criminal justice system. And I gave some examples of how we're trying to actually build intersectionality into our own justice system, but also to build capabilities to ensure that intersectionality applies in the justice systems in countries around us in approaching crimes at that more uh, fundamental level before it even gets to the ICC. So where does that land us? Uh, clearly, as a, as a government uh, uh, representative, I think that at Landsmeet looking again at sort of issues such as the ICC and how we how we staff it, how we recruit, how we staff, how we actually make sure that in the way that we approach uh, the cases that we have, the the ways that we actually engage with other countries uh, and across issues that we actually remember that intersectional issue. I thought 
And I can't remember who said it now at that point, that how can we understand these cases when we all sit in the same place or come from the same perspective? And that's actually very true and it's very hard to do. So I think from my perspective, there was a lot uh, that was uh, incredibly erudite to learn from here, but there were also some really fundamental questions about how do we actually bring an intersectional lens when we, we don't think in the right intersectional ways either. So, so from my perspective, that's kind of a, a, a rather rapid and not expert assessment of what we heard. Uh, and I suppose a question is left, how do we actually, uh, beyond staffing the ICC differently and funding the ICC better, how do we actually address some of these issues that we see? Now, that is a question that I think is out there. Uh, and and that's my concluding remarks. But thank you, everyone, for teaching me a lot uh, and for making me think a lot and prompting me to think about the way that we engage uh, on these issues here. Thank you, Ambassador. And I think that concludes uh, next. So if you would join me for just another round of applause for our great panel. And thank you again.